being an underdog is a real motivator. Darrell Walsh have asked me one time, he said, how in the world do you run as good as you run with no more money than you have? A lot of them was first chance. A lot of the guys that came through had never had an opportunity to work in, in NASCAR. I've seen people who thought they were mechanics and they, you know, you go right over there and do something so stupid that <laughs> anybody would know better to do that. We gotta see the Cartoon Network fire suit behind you. Because if we if we don't show it, there's gonna be a bunch of comments oh, saying, oh, yeah. I think that's a Cartoon Network suit on the wall. Oh, yeah. We're out here at GoPro Motorplex with Lake Speed and Lake Speed Jr. again. And we got kind of a follow-up questions on some of the guys that used to work for Lake. Because they all, I mean, a lot of them went on to do really significant things and we were talking, we were like, this has to be elaborated on because this doesn't just happen by accident. We, we need it's kind of the Hall of Fame crew chief school was, went through Lake Speed Inc. or Melling or wherever you were driving managing, you know? Been a lot of people, a lot of good people. The list kind of started off uh, people that were instrumental in, in my NASCAR career. Darrell Derringer was a retired race car driver, stock car driver. He kind of adopted me when I first showed up. Uh, first time on the scene to, to Charlotte, he picked me up at the airport and took me and showed me all around. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I, I told him, I said, you know, I don't know about just going in circle stuff. I just not, I've never done that. And uh, he said, well, we're gonna go to a race and we'll let you watch and see what's going on, this, that, and the other. So we, we went and watched the race up in Martinsville and sure enough, uh, I was looking at it and saying, you know, it doesn't look like there's maybe half a dozen of those guys know how to drive because they're all over the racetrack. And uh, he said, I think you're going to find this a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, uh, they worked out a deal for me to go test a car at Rockingham uh, at, back in November, I think it was that year, October, November. Went down there and drove the car a little bit. They said, oh man, you're doing great. I said, I didn't even run hard yet. And, when I proceeded to run hard, I crashed and tore the thing all two pieces, bruised myself all up and everything. <laughs> and I thought, hmm, this is harder than I thought it was gonna be. And just weird, the car was weird. I was used to driving one of these things that has no suspension. You don't even see my hands move when I'm driving around the track. You don't turn the steering wheel hardly any. And I was thinking, I'm in this big thing and it's flopping around. And back then, the NASCAR cars weighed 3,800 pounds. I mean, they were tanks and no trick shocks or anything. So they're floating, flopping all over which way, you know. So anyway, that was my outing. And so I've crashed the car now. Now what am I going to do? And I said, well, you know, you were doing good if you just hadn't wrecked. <laughs> you know? so there's a race coming up in Atlanta here in a couple of weeks. Uh, you want to go down and run a second car? I, this is a DK Ulrich who was uh, doing this deal. And uh, he said, put a second car together for you and take you to Atlanta. So we went to Atlanta. I ran in practice, ran fast enough to make the race. And I'm sitting up on top of a, a hauler, 18 wheel hauler, watching the guys qualify. And at that time, Buddy Baker was running really good. And, uh, I watched him drive off and turn one. He went off the corner, didn't sound like he lifted out of the throttle till he got halfway into the corner. And I thought, well, shit, I can do that. God, no wonder I'm not running as fast as he is. <laughs> Came time for me to qualify. I drove in. It spun out before I got to the center of the corner because I had never <laughs> cracked the throttle. <laughs> anyway, wound up crashing that, that sound car. distance, right? <laughs> <laughs> I went on this side of the track, that side of the track, it doesn't really tell you exactly what yeah, things I, are. Yeah, I wasn't used to this tracks that big you know go-kart tracks not very big <laughs> but anyway it, it really uh threw me for a curve daryl said you know i don't think you're gonna get to drive anybody else's cars you're probably gonna have to get your own if you want to do this but obviously, <laughs> <laughs> obviously you're not afraid so that's that's a good thing and uh so we bought this old used car and uh, carried it out to drove drove Daryl said, okay, I'll get a couple guys to work for us. And one of the guys that was working for DK that had seen me run to pra practice and then go down to the racetrack and run, he said, I want to be part of this. So he volunteered to come to work for us. He left DK and came to work for us and a couple other guys. And we took this old raggedy car and went out to uh, 
Ontario Motor Speedway at that time. It was the last race of the year. Missed getting in the race by one or two spots. I don't remember which, but uh, didn't get in. And then they took us the next weekend. They said, while we're already in California, there's a Winston West, Winston West race next weekend at Phoenix. We'll go there and get you some experience running with those guys. So, okay, so we get over there. We're running the race, and I'm running along there mid, mid pack. And says, all right, Daryl comes on the radio and says, okay, we're gonna be pitting here in a minute. Now get ready, don't don't get flustered or anything. We're gonna pitch you. You come in and get some gas. And uh, so by the time I'm starting to go down, come down pit road, he said, no, 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 stay out, stay out, don't come down. I said, no, guys. I said, what the heck's going on? What's going on? He said, John, the guy that we bought the car from, he could come with us. John didn't buy any gas. He said he didn't think you'd last this long. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of my introduction to the thing. So we came back to Charlotte, and uh, I finished 15th in the race, I think. Well, that was facilitated by Daryl Derringer? Uh, Daryl was, was overseeing the, the team, the little bitty team. Well, I mean, like I said, it was like three people. So uh, he was overseeing. I was still living in Mississippi at the time. Huh. I hadn't moved to North Carolina yet. Dean Anderson was the guy's name was working on the car for me then. Dean, you know, he was, he was a good guy and been around a lot. Stayed around for quite a while. I don't know what ever happened to Dean. But at the end of that year, we had, we had finished Darlington, I, I think, I was either seventh or eighth. I think I finished both sevenths, one race and eighth the other race as a rookie down there. Darlington was always a place I just loved and did great at. Uh, and the following year, got with Roger Hamby. Roger uh, was from up North Wilkesboro, and he's kind of had a uh, start and park thing almost. Just There was a bunch of guys that just wanted to be there and, be part of it, whatever. Roger had a, a, a muffler shop and a couple of kids working, high school kids working on his cars, whatever. That's where I met Donnie Disherman. Donnie was one of the kids there and Donnie was, uh, he's still, I think, working on one of these cup teams right now. Uh, he grew up through it and when we started our own team later in 86, he was one of the first guys to show up. He was a great guy. One of the first members of the ARC? Yeah. The guy, the original yeah, people yeah, who just yeah, showed up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was a tire changer, fabricator. He could do anything and everything. He had had to build motors when it Rogers, everything. He, just, yeah. he was kind of all around guy. He was good. Really good. So uh, ran with Roger. Roger kind of ran out of Junior's, uh, Junior Johnson. He did work for him. as. They had a little construction company too on the side, so he did stuff for, for them. And so we could run out of Junior's throwaway parts. So we'd go fast and break, usually, that's yeah. what happened. So anyway, after that year with Roger, uh, I don't remember all the details, but we put the other deal to go over to Hoss Ellington's deal. He had, whoever was driving for him, I think Buddy with Baker might've been driving for him right before I got there and Buddy got hired by one of the other teams, a bigger team that ran all the races. And that was the number like one car, the Uno, Uno number, one number one car, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got there, and that's where I ran across Shelton Pittman, and call him Run. I never could call him Run, because I had way too much respect for him. That man taught me how to race stock cars. I went from being a world champion go-karter to learning how to really race stock cars. I'd been driving and just driving and didn't know anything about the cars, you know, just didn't have it, no knowledge whatsoever. And Runt really taught me a lot and uh, put me in cars that were fast. And we almost won. Bunch of races. Bunch of races, yeah. we were close at, really close at. And uh, Darlington, again, every time we went to Darlington, we just had hands down generally the best car there. <laughs> it was crazy. Shelton was great. Then I went from there to the Ray Mock team, Butch Mock deal. And Butch uh, was crew chief there and worked with Butch. And, uh, you know, he had successful teams and did really well all through. And he was a hands-on owner. He wasn't just a sitting in the office guy. He was out there turning the wrenches and working on the cars and worked with me a lot. Had, had, had a big time with that. 
we split up and uh, in 86 we I've told you the story before about the, uh, the ark y'all call it but uh, anyway Daryl Derringer Daryl Daryl Bryant uh, was one of the first guys to come they just closed down Cliff Stewart he'd been with Cliff Stewart for years and years and had won some races and ran really really well had Jeff Bodine driving for him I think when they were having all their success and uh, then after that Rusty Wallace went there and Daryl was managing all over that running that whole program so he shows up and uh, then gosh Jay Beard uh, engine builder he had been there at Stewart's and he came down and said hey I'm following the, following the crowd here we, we come down and he brought a guy named Gail Pauly that uh, Gail's one of the top engine guys in the country for all kinds of engines still does everything at one time he was doing development work for all three of the big big three general motors forward all of them. when dodge came back didn't he have dodge, a, he was yeah, like the, yeah. the main development guy for dodge, dodge too. had a big yeah. old building yeah. I mean, he's like one of the cylinder head manifold gurus Guru, in fact i think right, in yeah. the first video there was a picture in the grinding room that was, that was gail and hand I, grinding yeah. away I mean, yeah. he's a legend yeah still is still did he kind of cut his teeth at in I, your team no, or? he came with plenty of know-how when he got there but him and him and jay worked together and, and did did really well and, you know just helped us we had stuff that would run up front you know we won one one and almost won several same same time uh jay and gail were there there's another guy been behind the scenes a lot his name is randy clary uh, randy was there with us too and randy went on to he's still building engines today he went on most of the from what i'm understanding and told all the restrictor plate races that the earnhardt's won that, that was all randy stuff that yeah, he, he was he the, was a guy over that. They just had guy, he just did the restrictor plate stuff, nothing else, just that, and he was awesome. Still is. Everybody knows everything now costs way more than it used to a few years ago, and that sucks. It's a good time to find ways to save money where otherwise you may not have tried to look before. And I'm here to tell you about Upside. It's pretty cool, and yeah, it actually works. Upside is useful for anyone who buys gas, which is probably you, diesel groceries or eating out for food what you do is it shows everything on a map and you can see you know like which gas stations will give you the most cash back per gallon it's like you don't save directly at the pump but you get reimbursed for it later so it's pretty cool and this is stuff you got to buy anyway why not save the money we primarily use upside for diesel and finding good deals on diesel because we use a lot of it and you can actually go in there and choose what fuel source you use so it can show you what you actually want get started download the free upside app in the app store or google play use my promo code stapleton in all caps and get five dollars off or more cash back on your first purchase of ten dollars or more next claim an offer for whatever you're buying on upside check in at the business pay as usual with credit or debit card and get paid you just upload your receipt to the app you can cash out anytime to your bank account paypal or an e-gift card for amazon or other brands Download the free Upside app and use code STAPLETON to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Also back in, back in that same era there with, with the 80, 83 car, uh, pit crew guys. Two brothers, Gary and Walter Smith, that were the first pit crew coaches around. They were in that picture. The Purex picture? Yeah, Purex picture. They owned a gym in Kannapolis and you know they said you know all these guys need to need to get more physically fit and do more training on it and everything so they wind up coaching teams a lot of the top teams so they were the ones coaching. that started they that. started with us yeah, I they're the ones that about started that. Yeah. Gary I remember those guys yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. didn't one of those guys they were going to Hendrick and doing something or yeah, like that they, they yeah. did stuff for just about everybody over over the years there and that, that kind of what brought the pro football players and everybody in too i think was shortly that was the after beginning that. of the yeah. making the pit crew guys athletes mm -hmm. that's a strategic thing to make yeah the races better or to have an advantage was having the faster pit crew 88 they were pitting my car when we won at darlington and you know the whole year yeah all that time too so and then 
he just stayed with me. And after that, Ruby Harrington, Robert Harrington, was crew chief, and he he brought some guys with him uh, over there. There, some of them are still in racing. Michael Cooper and Steve and Stephen Crow, Gordon Gibbs, just a bunch of guys that were fabricators, mechanics, whatever that went on did work for. Gordon, I think, wound up being the shop foreman at Earnhardt BI. All these guys at some place or another were actually crew chiefs or crew chief in cars or car chiefs or whatever like that with some of the top teams. How many of these guys, when they came to you, had like hardcore experience somewhere? There was a few that did, most of them didn't. Uh, like, for example, Tony Gibson. Tony had worked with his brother on ARCA stuff, but he had never worked on a chuck car. So, I mean, he knew, knew a lot about the cars, but never at the level that the, the chuck level. They're, they're, they didn't have an all-star resume, but they knew how to work on a car. Yeah, they, yeah, they, they had some stuff. It's kind of uh, fat back McSwain. I mean, he'd worked on some cars and whatever, but he'd never worked on a cut car. I mean, it's just different. <laughs> Everything's different at a different level. Can we talk about the day? You had Tony there. Gibson work for you. Yeah. Fatback work for you. Right. Troy Selberg right. work for you. Yep. Um, Jim <coughs> Long, Peter Suspenza, that's between the Lake yeah. Speed Inc. and the Melling, but right. I mean, all five of those guys all won races as crew chiefs yeah. at the cup level. Yeah. I mean, yeah. not sure how many races that is total, but I know it's, it's a bunch. Yeah. yeah. Was it a situation where they were volunteers to work for you, or did no, you give them we their paid. chance? Everybody got paid. Everybody got paid. I'd, I'm not gonna have anybody that, <laughs> <laughs> that I that can't produce enough to be, you know, make make yeah. some money out of the thing. I didn't know if it was one of those scenarios where they came to you wanting to work, or you hired them, like you gave them their first chance, kind of. A lot of them was first chance. A lot of the guys that came through had never had an opportunity to work on a in NASCAR. And they might have worked on some short track car or done something else like that. Uh, Mike, that big Mike, Mike Moore, Mike Moore. He was a student in college here. And then he, when he would get through his classes and whatever, he'd come work at the shop. He wound up being our jack man. And when we closed our team, Purex went away. Yeah. Earnhardt's much hired him. So he's Jack and he went straight from my car to Jack and Dale Earnhardt's car. Wow. Yeah. Nothing in between. <laughs> and my engine guy, when we closed down, Robert Yates had been trying to hire him for two years. And John went over there. He was top cylinder head guy for Robert Yates. I, I was blessed to have a lot of really good people that worked for me or with me. I tried to, I never asked anybody to do anything I wouldn't do myself, you know, and I tried to be involved. Because of the karting background with the kart stuff, I built my own motors, I built my own carts, I built everything. I did it all by myself, everything, and didn't have anybody. I'm in Mississippi. There was no top racing going on <laughs> in Mississippi, so I had to learn by myself. And I, you know, I give all the credit to God. I mean, there is no way that I could learn there was no place to, there was no books. There was, there no, was, Google. There was no Google. There was, there was, there was, there was no Google. That's what I was thinking, no YouTube there tutorials. No. He just had to, he gave me this ability to be able to look at something and understand how it works. And then if you understand how it works, you can try to figure out how to make it work better. And all the people, I mean, guys, dang, to have these kind of people come in and come and want to work for you is, said I, I just give God all the credit my, there's no way that the things that happened in my life and my career could happen without it divine intervention because it just it just can't happen it's, yeah to have essentially five almost Hall of Fame crew chiefs just come show up at the door and not say I want a job yeah that's pretty unique and right. each of those guys played their own role in yeah. helping keeping things going um, along yeah, you know just, a lot of times we were on life support you know oh was, yeah most of the 90s was that way some, it was yeah, rough it was almost closed down or did close down and go work for you know kale I, 
went down and managed his team, drove it. Then Mellon called me and said, man, we're, we've missed 14 races in a row. We ain't gonna even make a race. We've got to have some help. You were at the end there, of we never missed Bud Moore's career too. Like, like, hey, Bud, I didn't get that. Didn't have much as much to do there because I mean they're established. They've been doing this stuff before I was born, you know. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so they they kind of were setting their ways of what they were going to do. And, you know, I put in my two cents worth every once in a while, but it was not not being really received. That way. So that's one reason I wound up leaving. It didn't let me have as much influence as I wanted yeah. to have. Observation I had is Michael McSwain. Mm -hmm. We talked about on Dale Jr.'s show how he went door to door with all these different teams and everybody said no. And then he ended up at your door and you said yes. I thought maybe you take a guy like him who is determined to be successful, that he goes that far to take that many rejections and end up at your door. As there's, there's a common denominator in people like that that they, they had something in them that wouldn't quit. Yeah. And you ended up with all of those guys that had that in them. Yeah. Did you see that in them or did that, was that a coincidence? You know, I can't remember back exactly, but I do remember working with him, you know, he came to my shop and then later I run, run across him. He was already at Melling when I got there. So that was a familiar face, somebody that I knew and knew me and knew, knew my principles and how I operate whatever and uh so that was a, that was a really really good thing but to, to answer your question you know you, you interview people ask questions talk to them and you try to read them and to see it's like there's a lot of people that want to be fast car mechanics but some of them just don't have the gifting for it they, i mean they weren't wired for that they, they might be super fans but they're not wired for it. So I tried to always figure out, talking to people and interviewing them, how to evaluate what they've done already, whether they know where to put a lock nut on, right side up or upside down. I've seen it all. <laughs> uh, I've seen people who thought they were mechanics and they, you know, you go right over there and do something so stupid that anybody would know better to do that. You know, you say, this, this 30 day trial is over. <laughs> You, you, you got to go. You know, this is not your cup of tea. Here. Is that what you would do? You'd like say, give them a few tasks and see oh, if they screw get it up. Thirty day notice, baby. The thirty days. See what you can do. If you can do it, fine. If you can't, you know, I, no, no, no offense. Just we got standards, and you've got to be able to do it. And the other big thing I always had to do was personnel, personalities. You got to have a team of people that like each other and work together. And I don't care how skilled you are, if you upset the apple cart, I can't give away the whole apple cart just for you, because you alone can't do this. So I've had to let had to let a lot of people go just because they just couldn't mesh in with the group. I hmm. almost feel like you're like Nick Saban of race team owners. Kind of help mold them and mentor them into what some they are. Them, some of them, I mean, I was older than everybody. Most of everybody had to work for me, so I had to go. You were working in the shop too, right? Oh, yeah. So you you led by example. Yes, I mean, they're all you weren't just no. barking orders and leaving. You were no, 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 you were no, one no, of them. No. First in, last out. There's there's critical things that have to be measured. Man, I saw people measure stuff, and I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me, right? That don't work. That, that's wrong. <laughs> well, that's all we've always done it the way. I don't care if you always done it the way. I'm gonna show you, and I'm gonna show you why. And I'll explain to you why it needs to be done the way I'm asking you to do it. And so I, you know, I try to help people to do better at what they're doing. Was there anybody that you hired who was a total disaster that you let go that went somewhere else and got their ducks in a row and became something? I know. <laughs> I wonder that, like, like, oh, that guy was a total screw up, but he went and did this and this and this with somebody else. Like, he was just too early in life to, to get it together. I don't think so. I, I had some that that went, caused more money or whatever, you know. But that's the only only time I ever lost anybody. I think was, and some I had a couple of them come back, said, 
Yeah. Don't care. I, really, I like the atmosphere here is better than the money over there. Yeah. So you think? Uh, Daryl Walsh would ask me one time. He said, "How in the world do you run as good as you run with no more money than you have?" I said, "Daryl, all my guys are, all of them are putting out 100 percent." Getting the most out of what you got. Everybody's doing all they can do and showing up. That's well, the melling turnaround, I think that's a, I'll call it an underrated part of your career is that, no, you didn't win any races at melling, but you took a team that wasn't even able to qualify for races. Right. And in 1997, so three years later, without a primary sponsor, you're top 15 in the points when you're run out of money and you got to start missing races. Right. I mean, that's, that's huge. I mean, that, and that's a completely, that's 10 years removed from the Lake Speed Inc. era. So we were even further behind money wise. I, and then of course I was, I came in behind that and got to see the tail end of it. And was like, wow, we never, even with more resources later, we were never able to get back to that point because you, you had that right chemistry, but guys like Jeff Bice and a bunch of other guys that were there and at the time, it was pretty special. Thanks for bucking along real good. Me and God have <laughs> a couple long, talks about that. We had long talks about this, this concrete barrier that broke me all to pieces. But uh, yeah. anyway, that's, you know, God knew what he was doing. I had kids at home that needed dad more than NASCAR needed me. Blessed, I, I do get a kick out of watching a lot of my guys still out there doing really, really well. I, was, I went over to help. Bobby Hill was a good friend of mine. And after I got hurt, my career was over, Bobby called me one day and said, man, I got, I, I need some help, bad, bad. You know, and he said, can you come over and see if you can get this place straightened out? So I went, to, went over to work for him and uh, tried to get them going and got them going. One of your top crew chiefs today was the office manager there. Then Drew Bookensdorfer. He wasn't even working on the cars. He was just in the office, but he was going to the racetrack and, you know, he was watching and observing too, I'm sure. I'd, I'd be curious. I'd like to hear his side oh, yeah, yeah. Of, of, of how that went, but it, it was a big shock to me when I saw, saw him one day, you know, on TV and he was the crew chief and I went, hey, gun. Drew, you did good, buddy. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I can't believe that's great. I can't hear. Where's he at now? I don't know. Uh, Stuart Haas. Is it Stuart Haas? Okay. Yeah, he's crew chief for uh, uh, Amarillo. Oh, okay, for Eric. Eric. Uh, Another guy you coached, by the way. Yeah. Totally forgot about that. Yeah, driver, when, I, when I first came to Gibbs, you were driver coach. coach for Gibbs yeah. for, for Eric. Yeah. Remember going to the Caraway or Ace or somewhere we went? Ace. Ace. Yeah. When you were interviewing somebody, was there anything that you could see or feel or just kind of have that intuition that somebody has that 100% in them or they don't? Were you like, when you gave somebody a trial, were you right more than you were wrong? Or did you just weed out people quick enough to leave the good ones? Actually, we wound up not getting rid of very many. Really didn't. It was pretty good. If somebody's got the want in them, to do it, if they got that, you can teach people to do things if they really want it. But I mean, this this business will eat you up. It will just grind you to down. So if you got to have the tenacity to stick with it, but if you also are open-minded enough to listen to somebody and not think you already know it all, you can go well, you know? And so that was, I just tried to explain that to them on the front end. Up. And I had other guys, that other team members are all helping too. I mean, they want the guys to be successful. They don't, chain's only as strong as the weakest link. That's a fact. Yeah. You take that thing out there and you can have the best everything. You got one problem, you got a big problem. So everybody on the team is helping everybody else to be strong. And if they see weaknesses or whatever, they, they work with each other and try to work it out. You know, I, I think that's the camaraderie right there will carry you way further than just pure skills. 
I don't know how far back you go, but Hendrix hired Daryl and they put together the dream team, they call them, and they advertise mm -hmm. all the promotion and everything. This is, you know, you got the best of everybody. They're going to just rest people Darryl and well. Hammond and, and Waddell. They're going to wipe rest everybody of, out. You know, the rest of them you might not even, don't show even up. come. Yeah. You just don't even show up because the odds are stacked against you so yeah. bad. It didn't work. They struggled. Desire plus humility <clears throat> is a really powerful formula. Yeah. And you, you got to have that humility to be able to be a good teammate. If you get too arrogant, that that's where the interpersonal friction really becomes an issue. And you started that culture from the top down because you right. you are those things and you hire people and you they learn from you. They reflect you the way you do things. And then it it goes down from person to person. And the new guy is around like a bunch of your you know, mental clones, sort of. They're thinking along your guidelines. Maybe the way it happened, I was, you know, it's kind of hard to know. <laughs> you don't know what's going on between somebody else's ears. <laughs> you, you, you see what they do, how they respond, but, you know, on those things. I, I just know from... I pray hard about every decision I make, every hire, every thing, and ask God's guidance and wisdom, and then I have to just except whatever the results are. No, it's, I just know from walking around the garage and meeting these guys again, because they all knew me when I was little, and that I can know them now as an adult, all those guys to the man all loved working for you. And all thought that those days were some of their best days. They really enjoyed working for dad and being part of those teams because there was a culture yeah. amongst those teams that was different and unique from the other places they worked. And they all have mentioned that I mean, to a man, every single one of them. Pretty much everybody in that list he's mentioned, I've met at some point going forward. I still talk to Randy Clary pretty often, actually. And I mean, he loved it, right? And back to the intake piece in the manifold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I remember the first time we had one of those, Randy showed it to me. I, I'd seen one at a car. We were at uh, Talladega in 89. I was working on the team. And of course, back then, I looked like about 12 when I was 17. So no one paid attention to me. I could walk around the garage a little bit incognito and I saw the Wood Brothers car and they took the engine tuner guy, took the carburetor off the manifold before he put the rag over it. I could see inside and I saw there was something with four holes inside of it. And I told Randy about it. And about a week later, Randy came up to me and showed me a piece he had made. He said, this looks like what you saw. I said, yeah, I said, let's call it that. I'll see what it did. <laughs> and he was like 20 horsepower or something. He was like, Man, yeah, that's awesome. So you're you know? like an undercover spy. Going oh, I was, the I was totally. Oh yeah, oh, it, was, it was fun back then. I mean, the garage back in those days was it was a was family. A lot of innovation going on. That's yeah. hilarious. Yeah, a lot of creative, yeah. fun, yeah. cool stuff. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, this, this video maybe people aren't even really realizing this. This video was about racing. It was about people. Okay. Anybody in any discipline of any profession can listen to this and learn something yeah. if you're looking at it right. Well, that's what Coach Gibbs always said: is that he would tell racing stories to the NFL guys and the racing guys he told NFL stories because in the day it's about people always he said everything's about boils down to your people and coach was always big about having your priorities right he said you know number one priority should be God number two should be family number three is work because it's a big part of our day and he always preached that and his preseason speech before we go to Daytona those are some of my favorite speeches he ever had because he's he made that impact that he led by example and created a community there and it was about having the right people and everybody working together and that's what racing is really about you know it's in the day it's not about parts and pieces those those things change and come and go and i'll tell you it's another thing <clears throat> being an underdog is a real motivator you know you, it, it's a motivator for sure and uh, it can either depress you or it can motivate you Turning it into a motivation is uh, is a powerful tool too. I know people are going to ask about this. We got to see the Cartoon Network fire suit behind you, because if we if we don't show it, there's going to be a bunch of comments saying, oh, yeah. "I think that's a Cartoon Network suit on the wall." Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. That's so cool. <laughs>
and we were cleaning a bunch of stuff out and it had Jerry Nadu's name on the thing. Well, I pulled the tape off and it said Lake Speed. And I'm like, I'm keeping this. <laughs> oh, I think there's pictures of him, Jerry, wearing that suit where you can see the tape over it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. that somewhere. Yeah, I was in the shop and I was like, I grabbed it. And then as over time, as we started racing, I was like, this thing actually is kind of comfortable. I barely fit into it, so I, I still use it. <laughs> it's cheaper than buying a suit. Yeah. So this is what you're doing now? Yeah, oh, yeah. This is, uh, what do you call it? This is how I get my stress relieved. <laughs> stress reliever. Go out. You know, I, I was thinking about, you know, doing all this stuff with you has made me think about a lot of the beginnings. And uh, I've been riding these things since I was 11 years old. And all forms of them from yard cart. Started out with the yard cart with knobby tires on it. And she tore up mother's front yard. She got mad about that and said, You got to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> they said, Well, okay, we'll get something that's got some slick tires on it. So we got a racing cart. That was the beginning. That was it. And I'd, I'd been riding horses before that time. And I said, Whoa, we got a broken leg, beat up a bunch of horses, and kicked the pony off, and beat the wood, all kinds of stuff. I said, I think I like this thing with no brains. <laughs> you know, I can count on this. I know what it's going to do every time. That was the end of the horses and the beginning of carts. Well, when you asked him about whether or not he could still drive a car, right? That's why I thought about this. It's like, wait, he comes out here and on a normal day like today, there could be a couple of current cup drivers out here practicing. There'd be a bunch of them. And He's still able to go out there and run competitive lap times on a modern cart with those guys. In fact, with this super fast engine, he'd probably outrun all those guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, this thing's kind of cool, right? So most of these engines out here are going to be uh, either air-cooled or water-cooled two-strokes, either 100cc or 125cc. This is a 250cc water-cooled four-cycle. And it is wicked fast. We had it out here on the track last week, first time, and it was it was quick. And what's cool about this is that you know, for total seal, because it's a four cycle engine, the cylinder here is replaceable. So we can actually change out piston ring designs and all that kind of stuff. Whereas these other engines are basically factory sealed competitive engines. You really can't change anything, right? So you can't. It's a two cycle and it gets a, a mo or that homologated is, the, is yeah. the term they use that you can't change parts on them. It's illegal. So you can't mess with the parts. Huh? Right. So this is something with not homologated. We can do whatever we want to with it. So we can go out here and change ring coatings or cylinder bore coatings and we can, you know, take oil samples and analyze it. We can do all these cool things. So for me, it's a learning tool and we get to go out here and play, which is the best of both worlds. <laughs> best of both worlds. Are you about to take this thing back out on the track? Yeah, we'll go out there and run some. Yeah. Right, we'd like to see some of that. different than everybody else.
one more tooth off. He's still hitting the limiter? Yeah, get it off the limiter because you hear it at the end of the rib, you know, at the end of this straight away and the end of that other straight away, it gets on the rib limiter. Huh. Just a little bit. What is the rev limiter at? I think change that. They say like 12,000. Did I hear that right? I think, yeah, it's about 12,000. I'm pretty sure it's what it is. Wow. They didn't have the peak, and they don't have the peak. Enough. So I didn't really get it down. We hope you learned something useful about people and leadership and qualities of success in this video. That's really what we wanted to, to highlight. Because Lake did a lot with not very much. And there's there's a lot to be learned from that for even for me like camera aside i wanted to learn that stuff for my own internal library and we hope it helped you too also if you haven't seen yet we pulled an old engine out of his race shop and we're redoing it so we can put it back in one of his old cars and he can go drive it again so that's happening there's videos on that if you check out the racing history nerd zone playlist you can find all of it his shop where his original race team was is right behind his house it's still there there's still old cars in it it's freaking cool and the engine video where we dyno it and tear it down and all that stuff is on there actually we got the block for it right here we are going to take it to greg anderson's pro stock drag race team facility tomorrow to have this block honed with a fancy uh rottler machine that has some really specific cylinder wall finish like really really high-end stuff that Lake Jr. is going to explain better than I can because I don't know anything about this I mean I know a little bit but in terms of that kind of stuff I don't know but we got the torque plate here borrowed from PME and a gasket because their pro stock shop probably does not have a torque plate for a small block Ford so if you're a Lake Speed fan you're in the right place because that video is coming up next to me when we're filming that tomorrow. And we'll also have more information in that video as far as uh, checking the valve spring pressure to debunk the myth of if it if they lost pressure from sitting with the rockers engaged for so long. Like really technical stuff, cool things like that. We show you the machines, how it works, explain it all, the nitty gritty. And we're super pumped for it because as you just saw, Lake is 74 years old and he's still ripping that go-kart like nobody's business we'll see if you can do the same thing in a stock car that actually makes 700 something horsepower like it's supposed to spoiler alert go watch that other video also if you like the hat and the shirt that we're wearing you can find that at staplesandautoworks.com if you want to support the channel you can head on over there you can find shirts of a similar style kind of like that old school winston cup vibe we like that too that's not your thing won't hurt our feelings but it's there if you want it and we got stickers too ones that match these are like nine bucks the for i mean not each nine bucks you get all of these so there you go very last thing if you are not subscribed yet check and make sure that you are because a lot of people aren't even though they keep repeat watching videos for some reason Either they forgot to subscribe or YouTube unsubscribed them because people tell us that happens sometimes. I don't know how that happens, but it does. So, yeah. We're glad you're here. And I know I say that every time, but it's just so cool to me that there's enough people that love all the same stuff that we love that we're able to go make videos about it and keep ourselves alive doing it this is it that's why um that's how we're able to do this so often and why these videos have ads on it because that's how we pay for our food that's how we pay for diesel to go to these places and i spend hours on the computer doing research digging up pictures finding phone numbers tracking things like buildings all just all kinds of stuff you don't even understand goes into these history videos and that's that's pretty much it it's a full-time job and then some and we build stuff in the shop too like our own cars we do personal projects we got videos about that too if you're 
haven't seen him yet, but I feel like if you're still here and you haven't clicked away yet, you probably already know about that stuff because I feel like only the diehards make it this far. Most people, as soon as Lake stops talking, they're gone. They don't want to listen to me. So <laughs> if you're still here, I like you. There we go. We'll see you in the next one.